The age of gunpowder got underway in Asia around the 13th century, helped spell the end of the Byzantine Empire in the mid-1400s, and was entrenched in Europe by the time the 16th century rolled around. From that time forward, fighting efficacy, which in that era also meant the continuation of national existence, depended chiefly on a large and reliable supply of nitrate minerals, also known as saltpeter, which made up three quarters of the weight of gunpowder. As we've seen in the previous video, that wasn't a problem for the Mughals or at first for the Ottomans, whose lands produced nitrates in vast abundance as a result of their hot, dry climates. The emperors were able to equip and maintain large artillery corps and massive armies of musketeers with these supplies, ensuring their power and the continued expansion of their lands through the 15 and 1600s. These had the added advantage of being large states in proportion to their border regions, meaning that the fraction of land and resources likely to be involved in war at any given time was relatively small. It was a different story in Europe, whose most notable features in the 16th century were Michelangelo, Martin Luther, and constant low-level warfare accented by frequent crescendos. Gunpowder in ever larger quantities was vital in wars of all types. A single full-sized cannon of the late 1500s could consume almost 46 pounds of gunpowder with each shot. A culverin took 18 pounds. Individual military expeditions required tens of tons of gunpowder to have any chance of succeeding. And therein lay the problem. Europe was cold, damp, and had exactly the wrong climate for either forming nitrate deposits like the Ottomans had, or for synthesizing nitrates like the Mughals could. Between that and the continual fighting, there was never enough nitrate to meet the demand for gunpowder on any one side. Competition was cutthroat, often literally. Governments and wannabe governments throughout Europe spent the 16th through 18th centuries engaged in an, in an intense and undignified scramble after supplies of nitrate minerals. In retrospect, the story had the makings of a good, though bloody, farce. Both England and France, along with other European powers, embarked on state-sponsored programs to collect nitrates by scraping them off the walls of caves. This supply was totally inadequate in volume and almost as bad in quality due to the high proportion of calcium in the nitrates, which rapidly absorbed water vapor from the air and made them more or less constantly wet. In desperation, the monarchs and lords of Europe turned to collecting manure. England, France, and Prussia had monopolistic guilds of royally commissioned saltpeter men, empowered to enter any domicile throughout the land and collect all nitrates they found, along with all organic rich earth that could be processed for synthesizing nitrates. Since actual deposits of nitrates were vanishingly few in that climate, in practice, this meant digging up the floors of houses, outhouses, and stables, regardless of the sentiments of the occupants or the intensity of the stench. In England, saltpeter men were authorized to commandeer everything from firewood and coal to carriages, workmen, and even houses if they deemed it necessary to make nitrates. The owners were legally entitled to compensation, but this happened more in theory than in practice. Once collected, the organic rich earth was piled up in heaps and the saltpeter guilds would irrigate it, collect the resulting liquids and boil them down to precipitate the nitrates. This synthesis method worked in Mughal India with excellent results. In Europe, it failed miserably. In 1558, England's synthesis efforts produced less than one-tenth of the nitrates it needed, almost 50 years after the royal program had started. Other countries were little better off. The largest producer was Russia, where nitrate works in the dry regions around Astrakhan yielded a few hundred tons per year. This was enough for the Tsar to supply his armies and pay his Cossack guards in nitrates and vodka, but that was mainly because firearms were relatively rare outside of Cossack realms and demand in Russia was accordingly low. When European governments found state-sponsored manure collection failing, they turned to another dignified source, 
alchemy. The latter half of the 16th century saw a sudden and sustained upsurge in alchemical experiments, particularly those related to nitrate. Part of the attraction was the sudden availability of huge government funding for any possible improvement. Elizabeth of England paid one alleged expert 300 pounds in silver, several decades worth of income for a workman of the time, for an effective method of large-scale nitrate synthesis. The man took the money and skipped town, and many other experiments varied from the useless to the fraudulent. But some succeeded, and the rising levels of literacy and book circulation helped to accelerate what progress was being made in the technology. By about 1600, European synthetic nitrate production was rising, though not enough. Even the most strenuous government encouragement could not drive production higher than 100 tons a year in most countries. And while nitrate production went up slowly, the sizes and the numbers of guns involved in combat rose much faster. In the early 17th century, 100 tons or so a year of nitrates could have been close to meeting demand for gunpowder in peacetime. But in Europe in those days, there was no such thing as peacetime, and for very few countries was domestic nitrate production ever more than about half of what was needed. And what could be produced came at enormous cost in money and in public discontent. This had been chronic for centuries, but now became acute. The exigencies of the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648 put new strain on gunpowder supplies throughout the continent. In England, it led the government to double the nitrate quotas set for the saltpetermen. Predictably, the already high number of complaints about damage, financial loss, and vexation and oppression that the nitrate collection caused to citizens skyrocketed. The well-to-do had often bribed the saltpetermen to spare their own estates, a practice that now became universal for those who could afford it. Everyone else could do nothing but curse the saltpetermen, who acquired nicknames such as knaves, varlets, undermining two-legged bulls, and worse, as they dug up the floors of houses, barns, churches, and graveyards for the organic content to meet the quotas. The government largely turned a deaf ear to complaints, arguing that the depredations were necessary in the name of securing the nation's supply of critical minerals. Eventually, the public discontent would culminate in civic unrest in every nation in Europe, and in the case of England, helped cause outright civil war in the mid-17th century. By that time, the consequences of Europe's chronic nitrate shortage were no longer confined to Europe. Ocean-going trade had been rising since the late 1400s, and by the early 17th century, several of Europe's maritime powers had already established mercantile outposts on the coast of India. Originally, they shoveled Indian nitrates loose into the hold and shipped them as ballast, but by the middle of the 1600s, the military potential of the nitrates had become obvious to every government. At various times, England, France, Portugal, Holland, Austria, Prussia, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden were all shipping nitrates from India at the rate of hundreds of tons per year, while trying to elbow each other out of the trade. The Mughal emperors and Indian princes who received the hefty fees from the exchange encouraged it. So did the governments of Europe, who had to issue gargantuan subsidies to make the nitrate imports economic, but who preferred such commercial losses to being left behind in the arms and gunpowder race. The volume of nitrates imported into Europe rose sharply and steadily. As the supply of nitrates rose, so did the use of and demand for gunpowder. It made the 18th century in Europe an exceptionally bloody one, even by the standards of the time. The new flow of nitrates from India removed the limitations that a lack of gunpowder had previously enforced on the destructiveness. At the same time, advances in boring technology and the invention of the cartridge effectively quadrupled the ballistic power, rate of fire, accuracy, and reliability of artillery and firearms. Their use spread with their deadliness. <laughs> 
Before the 1740s, a major battle in Europe was one that involved a thousand casualties. By the Seven Years' War, the carnage commonly ran to the tens of thousands with each engagement. Military success for centuries calculated by the number of captured cannon and monarchs began to be reckoned in casualties instead. Nor was the destruction confined to Europe, as competition for Indian nitrate supplies went from clandestine trade affairs to skirmishing by proxy to open war with each other at the expense of the Indians. Too late, the Mughal and Indian rulers came to regret fostering the export of nitrates at the expense of domestic provision. India still produced thousands of tons of nitrate per year, but so much of it was shipped abroad that Indian troops, though amply supplied with musket and cannon shot, most often only had enough gunpowder to fire about a quarter of it. European firepower, propelled by exported Indian nitrate, was overwhelming in comparison. In spite of fierce resistance, by the late 1700s, the British had edged out the French and Dutch and conquered what remained of the Indian and Mughal states. An empire that had begun with gunpowder ended by means of gunpowder employed in the quest for gunpowder. The takeover of India put Britain in control of roughly 70% of the world's nitrate supply and, ipso facto, most of its firepower. Production of nitrates was reorganized, stimulated, increased, and directed to Britain, where the government used it to devastating geopolitical effect over the ensuing century and a half. Potential allies were encouraged to side with Britain by gifts and guarantees of nitrate, and potential enemies were informed that if they declared war, they would have to fight it without gunpowder. Domestic European production by other nations, despite the most strenuous efforts, could never come close to keeping up. Nitrate synthesis in France quintupled in the late 1700s under the expert guidance of the chemist Antoine Lavoisier, but was still less than half of what the British could bring from India each year. A few years later, the French revolutionary government guillotined Lavoisier on false accusations of defrauding the state and, worse, selling diluted tobacco. Nitrate and gunpowder production dropped again. By Napoleon's time, French infantrymen were issued only 30 rounds apiece, which would last maybe 10 minutes at then typical rates of fire. Meanwhile, the British infantry carried three times as much, with enough left over for the British government to supply arms and gunpowder to the anti-Napoleonic elements of the Spanish, Russians, Prussians, and Swedes, while at the same time fighting the Americans in the War of 1812. In later wars, the balance of nitrates and firepower was even more lopsided. Even in conflicts the British weren't directly fighting, like the American Civil War, the nitrates they supplied or refused to supply could make a decisive difference. Over most of the 19th century, British rule would spread across much of the world, making them the largest of all the gunpowder empires. But the turn of new powers was about to come.